Today's video is about Trigger.dev. Trigger.dev is an open source background jobs platform. It's super handy. If you have some API that you want to return quickly, but you have a background job that might take a minute or five minutes, you don't want to run it um, on your main Node.js server necessarily. So you can pass it onto Trigger.dev to handle that. And it's super helpful if you're using something like Next.js as well, because the default limit for a function call there is 30 seconds. And even if you set that to 300 seconds, a lot of your tasks might take a lot longer. So trigger.dev is perfect for those long running tasks. Now, this video is about how trigger.dev works, just getting to know the platform. And after this, I'm going to do another video about the inner workings of trigger.dev. So I'm going to dive into the code behind it. It's fully open source. It's quite a complex platform. I'm going to explain that to you in a second video. But so the homepage is really helpful. It gives us lots of examples of how we could potentially use it. So here we have an example of an AI task we might run. So it's called generate content. And here you can see the run function. So this is the code that will actually run. The first thing we do is a chat completion with OpenAI with GPT-40, generating some text. And then what we do is call DALI3 to create an image. And then we return the two at the end, the URL of the image and the text that we've generated. Now this task could, you know, I don't know how long it will take. It might take 30 seconds to DALI3 to generate the image for us. Now we don't want the user to have to wait 30 seconds to get a response for us from us from our API. So we'll respond immediately, hey, we're loading your image, then we'll add this to the queue, or in our case, we'll add it to trigger.dev. It will go perform the task, and then when we're ready, we can uh, update the user. Okay, it's been done. Another example of what could be a long running task is video processing. This could take a few minutes. So, again, we can offload it to trigger. Something that I use it for is cron tasks. So, for example, let's say in this example, we want to sync to Airtable once a day. So, we can do that. This task will run once a day. We'll call the Airtable SDK over here. And if you want, you can add another line over here, which is cron, and you can describe when the cron task should run. Um, just to add one line of code. There's two ways to call schedules.task, but um, yeah, crons are very easy with it. And the last thing I'll show you is weights. So, for example, if you want to um, do an action, then wait five minutes, then continue. So this is how that would happen. First, you would do start checkout. Now, instead of you having to do sleep for five minutes, you just call wait for. Um, trigger will do its thing in the background. You could even do wait for a year, by the way, or however long you want. And trigger will just handle it uh, completely fine. And then over here, you'll see we continue with the task, uh, whatever it is. And um, by the way, other things you can do is you can call tasks from within tasks. You can call batch tasks and so on. Uh, there's a lot more here, um, but feel free to take a look around. And here you can see a lot of big companies are using it, companies like Deer, Lyft, Verizon, Cow.com that we've covered in other videos. So it's very popular. I've been using it and I really, really like it. Now you have a dashboard where you can see everything that's executing. You can click into every task as well. So this is really cool to see and like every subtask as well. You can uh, add logs to it. And so this all runs within Trigger and you have a lot of visibility into what's happening more so than you might typically have. You don't have any timeouts, which is awesome. It can run for an hour and you won't have any problem or 10 hours. Um, it will scale to any size. You also only pay for the code when it's actually executing. So um, let's say we're deciding to wait three days before we send a follow-up email to someone. You don't have to pay for three days of waiting, which you might typically have to do. Um, with Trigger, you just pay for the time you're actually running it and not when it's frozen. Trigger is a full-on platform that hosts your code. Um, they recently put out v3, the v2 worked a little differently where you were actually running your own code. They'd be calling your own API. But for example, if you're using Next.js, you couldn't go above the five minute limit. So every chunk of your code had to be maximum five minutes. Here, they're actually deploying the code for you and that's the v3 and it makes things a lot easier. They have things like automatic retries built in. You can configure that exactly how you want and there's a whole bunch more here. So here you can see what the dashboard looks like. This is for a real project. Here you can see I have um, a schedule task that runs every Tuesday and Friday. You can see uh, when it's been successful and when it hasn't. And if there are errors, I need to take a look at how long the tasks are taking to run. Here you can see other tasks that I call manually via my own backend. You can click into it and see exactly how long tasks are taking and the details. Here you can see a breakdown of the task and how it ran. It took two minutes and there were lots of different uh, subtasks it ran to complete it. You can also see uh, the runs over here if you click this. And if you want to test it um, by running a task, you can do that as well. So there's a lot set up. And here you can see my different schedules that are running. You can see it's running every Tuesday and Friday at 10 a.m. UTC. Here you can see what Trigger looks like in a real production project. Um, the task is actually extremely small. Um, 
you just export a function, a task, you give it an ID and here's the run function. It can also receive some information like a league ID. This function processes waivers for a league. And then I'm just calling some code in my Next.js app. This code was already written before. I was running it in a different way beforehand, but I decided to move the logic over to trigger. And all I had to do was import it. And yeah, I've added some logs and returning a message, but it basically, you know, there was really nothing to do. Now, this task can actually be called by um, another task. So we'll take a look here at the parent task. Um, this is actually a scheduled run. So here you can see the scheduled run that I mentioned. It runs every Tuesday and Friday at 10 a.m. UTC. And it can also be run manually as a regular task. But here you can see I have schedules.task and here I just have a regular task. And within this task, I do a whole bunch of logic. I find all the different leagues it has to run on and so on. And then I can go and trigger and wait for the individual league tasks to run as well. You have a few different ways to run this. You could just call a trigger. You don't need to wait at all. You can do trigger and wait. So basically it will run the task and then it will jump back here when it's done. And you can also do these same things, but in batch. So if I want to run a hundred at a time or run a hundred at a time and then wait, I can do that as well. And you can adjust things like the concurrency and so on. You have a trigger.config.ts file. So that's what you're seeing over here. This is where you can set environment variables. This is automatically set up for you when you do trigger in it. Um, and you can, I, for example, if you need to set a Postgres database URL in the environment variables, you can do that uh, in Trigger itself. And if you want to hard code anything, so you could do that in this file if you want. To set the environment variables, just click here in the admin panel of trigger.dev. And to get this to all work, I just put it in a Trigger folder that you can see here on the left. Um, and you here you can see the different tasks I have running, which I deploy to Trigger. Now to run all of this, you can run a local CLI with dev and then you can test all of this out locally. And if you want to actually deploy it for production usage, you hit deploy as follows. And then in the admin panel, you'll see the different tasks. You'll see I have a dev version and a production version that can both run and those could be attached to different databases. So you can first test it out and then um, have it running on your production workload as well. The docs are a great way to learn more about Trigger. That's what I mostly use to get started with it. Um, we mentioned the triggers folder or the trigger folder. That's where we have all our tasks. Tasks are basically functions that we run. So here you can see hello world and this is the logic that's running. We've, I've already shown you this in my own project. And then the other part which is important is triggering, which we also mentioned. So here are the doc here's the documentation for triggering if you want to read a bit more about uh, what I mentioned before. One thing I'll mention is there's a second way to trigger functions. So one is uh, task.trigger as follows where you actually call it on the, like in this case, on the task instance. But if you want, you can also do tasks.trigger. So why would you use um, this instead of the task.trigger instance method? Tasks and import dependencies modules that you might not want included in your application code or cause problems with building. So if you run it this way, you can do task.trigger and just call it by name. And if you still want the TypeScript auto completion, well, I think you have to pass this, then you pass type of email sequence here. So this is just another way to run it, but both ways are completely fine. Now, one thing to be aware of when you're using the SDK, you should be using V3. Um, V3 changes a lot compared to V2, so but it can be confusing. So if I just import like this, I believe it's just the V2 import. So be careful about that. It's also possible that Google will send you to some of the V2 docs. Here you'll see the link to the V2 docs at the top. In short, I would use V3 and just, just be aware that sometimes a V2 code can creep in. If you see something like this, io.runtask, that's part of V2 and not part of V3. In V3, it would just be run task. You don't have any of this io or like io.openai stuff. This is what v2 would look like, io.openai, and in v3 you can see we're just using regular a open AI, which is great. Trigger is open source, so you can go and run it locally completely. Here you can see I'm running it at local host 3030. If you want to play with it locally yourself, I'm gonna talk about this a lot more in my next video, but just uh, git clone the repo, and if you wanna to go to contributing.md, file, then you'll find a series of steps that you can do to install it and run it yourself. Um, it worked for me first time, absolutely no problems at all. So very simple and smooth process. And you can even see it running down here right now. I hope you enjoyed this video. Trigger.dev has been really great for me so far. So I definitely recommend trying it out if you are struggling with long running tasks, especially with something like Next.js. And there should be another video coming out shortly, which really goes into the code behind Trigger. You do not need to understand how Trigger works internally to use it, but if you really wanna like sort of dive deep and improve your understanding as a developer, so I highly recommend watching that.
video. The CTO of Trigger was nice enough to help me understand the project, but yeah, it's quite a complex project that I wouldn't have been able to understand without some uh, external guidance. So I hope you enjoy that one once it comes out.